I've spent many years imagining this. I can visualize it. I do not have the ability to create the math that is needed. Some mathematical genius will. I have no doubt about that. These three fields pivot around each other in perfect symmetry. They transform their energy with beautiful symmetry from one type of field to either of the other two. I am in simple awe of this. The new math that is needed must take into account the continuous and non-vanishing interaction of all three fields. It is obvious that the values for the electric and magnetic fields change at different points on the wave. However, keep in mind the value for the gravitational field can change as well. As far as things go, this basic explanation is simple. The particles are at rest or have a constant motion. Beyond the basics, the new math must also describe two other more complex situations. The first is where the spherical waves change their diameter and shape, where they pulsate and vibrate. The second is where the particles accelerate or decelerate. When you think about how spherical waves change their diameter and shape, how they pulsate and vibrate, you might consider using a Hoberman sphere. And this might help you visualize how, as the particle is moving around, it can get bigger and smaller and change its shape and twist. And so uh, the Hoberman sphere is a very nice way to help visualize this. Now, I'm not going to go into this in depth. If you'd like to think about this, then to get started, first visualize drum head vibrations on a normal flat drum. Next, visualize wrapping the drum head around an invisible sphere. Then visualize how the waves could vibrate over the surface of the sphere. Now, stop thinking of a physical drum head. Replace that concept with the three fields. The electric and magnetic would be on the surface. The gravitational points to the interior of the sphere. In Einstein's view of physics, using special and general relativity, space and time must distort. In this new physics, that distortion and any dilation or contraction is happening in the spherical wave. In this new physics, the dilation and contraction are not happening to space or to time. In this new physics, space becomes an unchanging backdrop that, once again, is simply a measure of extent. In this new physics, time is not the fourth dimension, is not another dimension of space. In this new physics, time is simply the fastest motion. In this new physics, everything simply moves at fractions of the fastest motion through our unchanging three dimensions of space. Again, in this new type of physics, dilation and contraction indeed are happening. However, it is happening to these spherical waves not to space and time. Again, mathematicians often refer to these waves as solitons. Of course, the name superstrings seems wrong to me, since the geometry of solitons is spherical. In my head, whenever I hear someone say superstrings, membranes, brains, or solitons, I think superspheres are simply spherical waves. I am no expert in mathematics, but fields vectors in differentials seem insufficient. In my opinion, they are not elegant at describing this type of wave. It seems to me some new type of math is needed. That is the end of discussing the old information, the information for mathematicians. Now, let me once again show you those two key animations of spherical waves so we can start working on the new stuff. As I have said, spherical waves have three vectors, or you might think of it as three fields. You may recall in this animation, I use colors to represent fields. And you may recall in this animation, I use colored arrows to represent vectors. In my opinion, 
these three fields or vectors are components of the unified field. In my opinion, mathematicians should be very excited by these animations. This is a physical representation that goes beyond prior mathematical representations of solitons. This goes beyond a geometrical manifold because it includes the electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields and describes them as a unified field. Recall, the electric and magnetic fields are on the surface of the wave. These two vectors are always tangential to the surface of the wave. And you may recall, the third vector points to the center of each sphere. This third field is gravity. The central equation of my grand unification theory is this. This vector equation explicitly states the third vector, the third field, is the gravitational field vector. This vector equation allows us to analyze the three fields at any point on a spherical wave. Notice how the equation looks like the pointing vector. The only difference between the pointing vector and the gravitational field vector is a constant. I understand this might seem like an overly simple ripoff of the pointing vector. In a way, it is. However, keep in mind, I am giving credit to pointing, and somebody has to say this, because physics must travel down this path. Personally, I would love to hear the account of how John Henry Pointing came up with the pointing vector. Also, keep in mind, for about the last 100 years, any physicist could have spotted this. They didn't. I did. Did I have an advantage? Yes, of course. I solved the mystery of time. That gave me a huge advantage. An advantage I no longer have sole possession of because I've given it away. I also had another small advantage. I believe because as a young teenager, I had pondered how mass transforms into energy and how energy transforms into mass. My mind was ready when I later learned about Poynting's equation. Let me emphasize, maybe, I might be wrong about something here. However, let's examine what is right. First, the Poynting vector is right. It has withstood the test of time. Physicists have been using this equation for about 100 years. It, des it describes something that is really happening physically. Second, I define the gravitational field vector using this equation. Because this is a definition, this cannot be wrong. So there is nothing inherently wrong with this grand unification equation. While this is the simplest form of this equation, it could be reformulated. We could include a variety of useful values and constants, the speed of light, pi, the number two, three fourths, Planck's constant, or any number of other constants. I like this version of the equation because while it still gives credit to pointing, it also creates a vector that is explicitly unique in comparison to the pointing vector. Something with a unique name, the gravitational field vector. The important reason for redefining the pointing vector deals with grand unification. Think about this difference. Imagine this. During a conversation, I asked someone, did you know the cross product of the electric field and the magnetic field gives us the pointing vector? Not only is this not interesting, it is esoteric, really. This would only be something that interests a physicist. Instead, imagine this. During a conversation, imagine I asked someone any of these questions. Did you know the equation E cross B equals G unifies physics? Did you realize this means that the three fundamental forces are the electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields? Do you realize the grand unification equation combines and unifies them as one fundamental force? Did you realize this means the strong and weak forces are no longer considered fundamental forces? Do you realize this is a quantum theory of gravity? There are hundreds of interesting topics that could be talked about. Everyone knows gravity Almost everyone has played with magnets. 
and more or less understands the magnetic field. Many people understand the electric field. Almost nobody outside of physics has heard of the pointing vector. If you doubt me, take your own poll. Go around and ask people, do you know what gravity is? Do you know what the pointing vector is? If you poll 100 people on the street, it's highly likely that your results will be 100 to 0. Simply defining the gravitational field vector is important because it allows the layperson to easily understand this grand unification theory. You may not agree with how I define it. That's OK with me. I don't care. Physicists can come up with a better definition than I have. However, one way or another, they need to agree on how to define the gravitational field vector. Think of this grand unification equation as a proposal. Thank you.